You know, our physical wounds, we know when we got them. <clears throat> if you have a bullet hole or a knife wound or a broken bone or, and somebody asks you, you know, well, how did you get that? You don't go, oh, geez, I don't know. I just must have broken my leg somewhere along the way. <laughs> <laughs> you remember, it was, you know, that summer day in June, and I was up in the oak tree, and I fell, and, you know, no one was there, and I felt frightened and alone, and it's very vivid. We remember exactly what happened when our body was wounded. So it occurs to me that we also have those exact same memories around in the emotional body, that there are scars in the emotional body. And in psychology, we talk about trauma to the, kind, to the psychology, which uh, is mm, sometimes a little different than just the emotional body, because there's also thinking in there and a sense of self. So that these kind of wounds can, and they could all be the same thing, something that impacts the body and goes deeper in to the psychology, deeper in to the emotions, mm. and then into the soul. Mm. Some wounds are like that, right? They penetrate all the way. Mm. And some, you know, some things hurt our bodies, but they don't. And other things slip under the radar of our body, our emotions, and they just go straight in, and they put a cut in the soul. So that's why we do this work, I think, on different levels, to, to expose and heal and give air and light to some of these wounds to the, to, the body, uh, to the emotional body. And we pretend to do that uh, for psychology in my field, and mostly that's a really failed art. Um, there are a few who do it well, and so you need to choose very wisely if you're going to go to some practitioner of psychology, because I think largely we do more harm than good even though we're well-intentioned. It occurred to me that if somehow we skip this stage of initiation, or it doesn't go well, and we get caught in there, perhaps that becomes an anchor, like an anchor that we drag behind us, or you, you talked about that black bag of shame. How does that uh, weigh us down in this later quest of life to move towards the divine, towards the eternal. Can we do it? Can we do it if we've skipped over these earlier stages? Yeah, I don't you know. you limp a little, you know? You limp a little into the divine. Dragging your bag around. Yeah. So maybe it's ballast then, not, uh, not an anchor, just something that makes us rise towards the divine uh, a little more slowly. But I think it, it, it calls to us to have this attention. And some of us, you know, we can't work this stuff out with our mothers and fathers because, first of all, it would be abusive to them to even uh, present some of this uh, material to them in, the, in their late age. And then many of them have already passed on, and some of us never knew them. So to literally work out some of the wounds of childhood and adolescence, uh, if we receive them from our parents or our teachers or our priests or whoever it was that... Uh, that put the hole in the soul. Uh, one, the thing that led me into the, the, the work that I'm doing now is, uh, you know, we're almost at the year 2000, and when that clock turns, there's another clock that's going to turn, which is the two million clock. And the two million clock is the number of men that are going to be in prison uh, in the year 2001. And I've grown very alarmed about that. Actually, for all my kind of radicalism and uh, leftism over the years, I, I really believe in a lot of the dream of America. And I see that ideal perhaps is, uh, is really at risk now in our time. And um, Bob Roberts has been a real inspiration to me, be, and we'll, hopefully we'll hear some more about his work uh, during the course of the week in working with men who are coming out of what some of us are calling the American Gulag as a, a kind of reminiscence of the Gulag archipelago that was in Russia when Solzhenitsyn wrote about it about 20 years ago, I guess it was, and brought attention to the world huh? 40, years. 40 years ago. A number of us are concerned about this and talking about it, and it's kind of growing in the collective consciousness, and I, for many years, was trying to publish this book, American Gulag, and what about the prison system, and nobody cared, and nobody wanted to hear, and nobody wanted to publish it. 
Uh, and actually people insulted me and got angry at me and all kinds of horrible things happened. And I was at the top of my game, I thought, you know, that I could do anything I wanted to and uh, they would, you know, line up. And just the doors were just barred against me everywhere. And I started thinking more and more about, well, what, you know, what's underneath this? Why are we, this nation that embraces freedom as our central ideal, I mean, that's what we're most proud of, mm. you know, is, is liberty. That's, that's the, um, the clarion call of America, is the land of the free. And we have more men, particularly men, and particularly young men, in prison than any other nation in the world. It used to be that uh, we were number one, then the USSR was behind us, and when they dissolved, Russia got a little bit of ahead of us, but they've just declared an amnesty and are releasing about 100,000 prisoners. Oh, I didn't know that. <clears throat> well, they can't afford it anymore. <laughs> and uh, so they're trying to start emptying the prisons now particularly of those, the many who are there for political reasons or social issues who are not really violent or dangerous criminals, which is the profile of most of the men who are in our prisons as well. Uh, only about a third of them are in there for crimes of violence, and often those crimes of violence are not the most severe ones that we think of, like homicide or rape or armed robbery, mm -hmm. kidnapping. Uh, the top 10 reasons that young men in particular are in prison in California is for drugs, drug possession, drug dealing, uh, driving under the influence of drugs and alcohol, um, burglary, auto theft, uh, things of that nature. Things we would rather that they weren't doing, but uh, crimes that in my opinion should not be bringing them 5, 10, 15, and 25-year sentences. Uh, and going now more and more, the trend or the response post-Columbine, post-shootings in Oregon, post, um, you know, now that it's kind of breaking out into white middle-class boys who are carrying guns and killing others in a very visible and dramatic way, the response, rather than to ask the question, why our children feel the need to be armed, why they're so angry, uh, why they are so afraid, the majority of the response from our leaders, supposedly the enlightened and educated people of our nation, is to build more prisons and to make longer sentences and to have zero tolerance in the schools. So we've moved from a society that valued tolerance and embraced diversity to having zero tolerance. That means drug-sniffing dogs, uh, metal detectors, uh, warrantless searches of lockers and backpacks, and immediate expulsion or suspension for a violation of a, a growing number of rules and laws. This isn't just about guns. I mean, guns was like about 17 I think it was around 17,000 expulsions, but there were 600,000 expulsions of boys from school last year. In some schools, uh, as many as a third of the African-American boys, eighth grade boys, are kicked out every year. In some schools, it's even half are kicked out of school for violation of some rule or the other. So a friend of mine asked me if I could try and trace the pathways in my own life that led from, you know, foster care and living on the streets and growing up in juvenile institutions and being involved in criminal activities to getting an education, <clears throat> healing some of the psychological and emotional wounds, moving on to a spiritual path, and then um, having the good fortune to have a, a fulfilling uh, life of value. And um, he asked me to write that out as 10 stages and sent it to him. And he said, well, that's your book. Why don't, you, why don't you put that out there? So I wrote that up as a proposal, and immediately the publishers wanted uh, to do something with it. I had never wanted to tell my own story. And it was kind of pulled out of me. And, you know, it's a legitimizing thing. How can you run around and tell people things? 
what they should do or what's a good idea or what's a good way to go if you won't share with them the truth of your own experience. I think there's something fundamentally uh, deceitful and dangerous about that and most, if you read psychology, there's very little subjectivity in most of the theory. In other words, the voice of the author, his life, her life, their experiences. So going back to, Robert asked me to talk about abuse. Child abuse is completely out of control in the United States. There are about three million incidents now a year of child abuse being reported. Uh, that's what's reported, that's what's on the books. And we know a lot of stuff doesn't get to the books. Now, at the vanguard of a uh, kind of concern about this issue, it's largely women who have been trained in the departments of sociology and psychology in our universities over the last uh, 10 to 30 years. And the ethos, the, the, the concern, the, the direction of that study for, has largely been on the restoration of uh, the psychology of women, the healing of women, and the protection uh, of the lives of girls. And this is very important work, and I'm not meaning to demean or in any way uh, say that that focus shouldn't have happened. But an unfortunate con fortunate consequence of it is a number of myths have been kind of projected into our culture that it's mostly girls who are suffering. You know, we have this, uh, what is it, raising Ophelia, reviving Ophelia. Uh, girl, we know girls' self-esteem crashes at school and girls are suffering from incest and sexual abuse. And all that's true. But somehow when we don't talk about the boys, by omission, the implication is, well, things are much better off for them. And in fact, that's not true. It is true that more girls are sexually abused than boys. So this, um, this is a big deal, and it's not being paid uh, sufficient attention to, particularly by Child Protective Services and all of those who are mandated to go forth and protect children. There needs to uh, be a social awareness around the fact that the majority of children being killed, ne medically neglected, physically abused, and uh, suffering the highest degree of injury is not girls, it's boys. Um, but there, you know, the psychology around this is very complex, but it has to do with being a warrior culture and some of the stuff we've talked about in the past, this idea that men and boys are tougher and we need to toughen them up and therefore things that seem like abuse towards girls are not really abuse towards boys. If I had, if I was 12 and I had sex with a 30 year old woman, uh, I got lucky, right? I was, I became sexually aware at an early age. Uh, I was initiated by an older woman. Now that could be true. All those things could be true, but if they were true for the 30 year old man, a woman and the 12 year old boy, then we should hold that same paradigm, that same uh, way of evaluating what is valuable or what is harmful to a child for the 30 year old man and the 12 year old girl. Now immediately we go, oh no, that's, <coughs> Not such a good thing, unless you're a 30-year-old man, you know, pursuing a 12-year-old girl, and you might be in here, but most of us, if not all of us, would have some revulsion to that. But the reverse is not true. Statutory rape against boys wasn't even illegal in California until 1996. Uh, so that's this one arena. Okay, I'm t uh, talking about a kind of hierarchy of abuse. What, where are the arenas in which boys are abused the most? The least abuse happens where a father is present in the home, by far. Particularly where there's a biological father and mother in the home, that's where the lowest level of child abuse happens. The highest incidence of child abuse happens in single mother homes, particularly those that have an unmarried male living in the home with her. And that rate is like 19% compared to the 3% of the biological mother and father. But it's something that we need to be aware of. And when you come up against sociology 
and you make these kinds of observations, then they think, well, you're blaming the mother. You're trying to demonize the mother and say that mothers are no good. Well, that's not, that's not the point. The point is that fathers are good. Um, not all fathers certainly would rather have a single mother than a drunk or abusive or sexually or physically out of control father, as many of us have had, and that's part of what brought us into this, as, as Robert was saying. So the home is this first arena, or this first pathway to prison, you know, kind of living on a house on fire, um, foster children of whom we have uh, about a third of a million boys in America now in foster care. Uh, I lived in about six or seven different foster homes as a kid, and it was weird. And they are highly overrepresented amongst prisoners and the homeless uh, and the unemployed as adults, as are these abused boys. Uh, in school, <clears throat> boys come in, and the same shift that has happened in sociology over the last, recent decades has also happened in the schools. Most of our teachers, our primary and uh, secondary educators, are women, and they have been trained in educational programs where most of their teachers are women who, again, have had this focus on how can we make these institutions work better for girls? And that's been an important thing. But the, and, and we know that we're failing at fairness towards girls. We've, we've heard that there's been a lot of publicity about that. But actually, in every single category that you look, with the exception of math and science and physics, that's the arena that uh, the, the gender equity uh, programs have focused on, boys are doing far worse than girls. They get more Fs, they drop out at a higher rate, they have overall lower grade point averages. They are disciplined 10 times over the girls. They are corrected more, shamed more in the classroom. If a girl is acting badly versus a boy acting badly, the boy is much more likely to be pointed out in front of the whole room, Johnny, stop that or you're going to the principal, whereas the girl is more likely to be taken aside during a break and talked to because we think they're more uh, fragile, more delicate or something like that. Yes, so one of the ways we're controlling behavior, and a lot of you know about this because it's starting to leak out, but... Uh, we have about two million boys on Ritalin now, and another million on uh, Prozac, anticonvulsants, and other kinds of antidepressants. That's a whole new realm that the pharmaceutical companies are getting into, a new lucrative market, which is uh, the medication of children. None of these, the, the aftermentioned things, have ever had clinical trials, Prozac and all of that, They've never run clinical trials to see what they do to children. They, they've run a lot of trials on adults. So this is the increasing thing, and this is also true in the foster care facilities and juvenile institutions. The majority of the children in those institutions are medicated, some heavily medicated, to kind of bomb them into a state of compliance. And this is happening more and more in the classroom. Well, why is that? Why is it there's so much the focus on boys? I think that traditionally feminine values like neatness, conformity, uh, repetitive verbal skills, cooperativeness, uh, politeness, those kinds of things are the valued virtues. And particularly <clears throat> young men who are coming out of cultures <clears throat> in which that's a valued part of their culture. And we see this <clears throat> in African-American boys and Latino boys, particularly, a sense of aliveness and vitality and play that is uh, not, perhaps not as repressed as it is in white culture. And so they get the brunt of this, this bias in the schools. And that's why they're being kicked out at such higher rates. Not because they have higher rates of bad behavior, it's just more targeted. And we like to think of ourselves, particularly educators, as being somewhat liberal and tolerant. But in fact, racism is, is rampant in our schools around this issue, it, and particularly around boys. Minority girls, their rates of college participation are going up and up and up. They're getting more positive attention from the teachers. 
boy, minority boys report the least positive, most negative attention of teachers, and their college participation rates are going down and down. So in addition to f failing more and dropping out more and failing to graduate more and being held back in grades more and being 70 to 80 percent of the special education students and the remedial education students, students who are shunted out of the mainstream classroom uh, because they're not really moving at the pace of the classroom. Um, this zero tolerance has now come in on top of all of that, of this kind of what I think is sort of an anti-boy bias, an unconscious anti-boy bias in the schools, um, and saying, we won't tolerate anything. You bring a pea shooter to school, you're out of here. You have a slingshot, you're out of here. You wear one of these uh, pocket folding knives that, uh, that boys love, you're out of here. You act out in the classroom, you're out of here. You smoke, smoke a cigarette, you're gone. Smoke a joint, you're really gone. Uh, not only will we kick you out of school, but we'll try to get you into jail if we can. Now, not everybody's like this. But I tell you, if you look at the stats, boy, it's really going up and up. And where are all these boys that are getting thrown out of school? And what happens to them? You know, we're like the catchers in the rye. If they get past the parents, if we parents can't catch them, the schools are next. We're like the last, next line of net netting. And if they rip through that net, then they're, they're out on the street. They're in the community. And a lot, a lot of you, I know, are doing that work, trying to pull things together in the community. It's kind of the next level of, uh, of catching. But the schools aren't doing their job. We should be suspending the boys into school, into the kinds of programs that the men here uh, know at least to some degree um, how to administrate. That means getting more men into the teaching profession. There are only 2% only of our, our teachers are, are male uh, ethnic or racial minority teachers. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Um, so that's a real problem for those boys who are mostly in classes with white women. Um, their, their behavior, their language, their whole style of being doesn't fit with the middle class, with the white middle class ethos that those women have been trained in. And I, again, it's not to blame them or put them down. This is just something that's kind of gone askew uh, in our culture. So the drugging is also a problem. The drugging is a shortcut. The drugging is about uh, not really dealing with the issue, but trying to get the boys to settle down. And here's the point. Uh, this kind of, I think, underscores, I mean, this is just a theory, but about the, the, the classroom being anti-boy. Um, the gender equity specialists say, well, the boys interrupt more. And so we need to have these special courses for the girls because girls aren't quite as assertive as the boys. But we're not giving them drugs to make them more assertive. We're not giving them speed or methadrine or a crank. <laughs> no, think about it. You know, we want more assertive girl. Well, if we just kind of changed her biochemistry a little, she'd speak up more. She wouldn't be intimidated by the boys. Uh, she would overpower them, right? <clears throat> but we are drugging the boys to keep them quiet. Now, there's something wrong with that. But it's these cuts to the soul. It's these cuts to the emotional body. It's these cuts to the spirit of boys. Money going into education, particularly higher education, is steadily declining. In California, in the last 10 years, we've built one university and 21 prisons. Two years ago, for the first time in America history, spending on prison building and administration was greater than that for higher education. Right. There's been this trade-off, and now states are analyzing this, state by state. Uh, Illinois has looked at it, and, and Washington, D.C., and Ma uh, Massachusetts, and California, and in all of those states are spending more on prisons um, than on classrooms. So 
we won't put the resources into the school. We're not putting the resources into child protection. We're not putting the resources into getting young men who might like to teach or our mentor or supporting men who are doing this kind of work. But we are more than willing, more than willing to spend twenty-five to thirty-five thousand dollars a year to house young men in prisons. And, and it's a dark thing, but the, the, the point is, and this is the last thing I want to leave us with, is they come back to us. These men are coming back, and that's, that's a mission a lot of us can kind of <clears throat> take on, and we'll talk more about the practicalities of how we can do some of these things in the homes and schools and communities. I like it. Thank you.